Good afternoon. It's not so easy to run a program after three o'clock in the afternoon. So I'd like to give you permission, should you want to doze off, you can. But please do one thing, don't snore, so that's okay with us. So therefore, this is a very interesting topic and uh, about the influence particular economic influence from China. So I like to, to start off with Milos first from Venezuela and then from my friend from France. He's 101% uh, French <laughs> because his father is English. So <laughs> he has a more different. And then we have, he will be having the last word. He's from China. So we talk about China, so he can have the last word, yeah. And maybe he can give us some ticket for the Chinese restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> so, Milos, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, Professor Rogpitya. Rogpitya, yes. I, I, I will not insist in the pronunciation, probably. Well, I'm not pronouncing it. <laughs> Well, first, to start saying that um, I feel very, very happy to be here in the library of Akrav Havel that has brought us all together here with the name of uh, freedom, democracy, and all what he represents, not only for uh, the Czech Republic, but also to Europe and to, to the world. Second, if somebody's going to snore, it's me. I'm traveling from Saturday, and I just arrived 15 minutes ago to the airport. So, uh, but um, I, I feel very happy that I could make it. Uh, don't count those uh, preliminary words, please, uh, Professor. <laughs> but, uh, well, uh, this is one of the most important and challenging topics. I would like to, uh, to uh, speak about the expansion of the global economic influence of China, which has had a tremendous expansion in the, probably I wanted to read it, but uh, because my English is not very good, but if I read it in this uh, group, we are going to lose a lot. I'm not going to insist in the figures about how this expansion of the 21st century has created, uh, has become the largest importing and exporting country that created a series of links in, with, with the country. So the second uh, pre-remark that I would do is uh, that, of course, the more there is the modernization of economy, the liberalization of economy, it will have a very strong impact that will challenge the one-party system because uh, with economical tendencies and uh, bringing in, especially here in Europe, we saw how the opening of some borders have made that the people from Eastern Europe started to see the needs of a better quality of life, will bring also democratization. What we have left, lived these days and we have seen in Hong Kong about the situation that wants to stop the possibility of the one country, two systems, to impose a one country, one system, is not so much because of the fear of Hong Kong, but I think, but the fear that Hong Kong democracy could influence internally China or what could happen in Taiwan's democracy and the influence that it would have of people because of the economical trend want also to have political changes as the one we are remembering this day, the 25 years of Tiananmen. But uh, let's uh, become in this table, the, problem, the, the, the aspect is the expansion of the economy. And I would divide it in four, four uh, subjects. The North-North relationship the north-south relationship, the south-south relationship. Uh, China has, of course, the big um, uh, relations has been with the multinationals, with international capitals, with the know-how of economy of the developed and capitalistic world that has made the changes. Nevertheless, they have not lost a very important conditions to situate themselves in the third world countries so that they can, in this boom, economical boom, to maintain the South-South relationship. So uh, and they have offered a series of conditions that 30, 40 years ago, the third world countries were uh, having a very strong 
critics to France, for instance, when they had the uh, late proletaire monde, the, the support for the third world, they said, well, this is not uh, uh, an aid for our countries. This is the expansion of French products or English products or American. We want to have trade, not aid, where some of the countries, well, China is having this kind of approach that uh, in the case of, uh, I will concentrate first in the global G77 and China. Uh, Two-thirds of the United Nations are members of the G77 plus China. And China has uh, worked a lot to maintain this uh, characteristic of opening the markets for very big enterprises and for European and United States enterprises. But at the same time, it, it plays a role with the third world countries. That applies to Asia, to Africa, and to Latin America. I will start with Latin America. What? have did, the Chinese did in this political frame. Everything that was bad from the Occidental and industrialized countries in the past is now received as very good. Because in the economical crisis, China has uh, started to uh, work in two mechanisms. One mechanism is the multilateral mechanisms. In the case of Latin America, they have, uh, they form part of the BRICS. The BRICS is uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, South Africa, and China. But the one who has had more impact in these emerging countries is China that created a bank uh, in Shanghai that will deliver multilateral goods that will permit this expansion in Latin American countries. One fact that I wanted to, to, to stress when the, there was this year in Fortaleza, the meeting, all the chief of state and government of Latin America went to Fortaleza, basically to meet with China. That they would not do with Mr. Barack Obama, not all. That they would not do with the president of some European country, they did it with China. Of course, there was also Putin from Russia. That also plays a very important part. But it's very important to see how uh, these uh, chief of state that are critical to the United States, basically, uh, for the presence of the American capital or the Europeans, uh, which are considered colonialists or capitalists, especially in this frame of the new tendencies of Chavez and company, are very happy to receive uh, and to receive uh, the investments. Of course, China plays a, a, a double role because uh, they are members of the WTO organization and accepts the rules of the game on the economic. But on the other side, it helps some programs that also helps China. What do they do? They make big plans uh, of investment in, uh, in, uh, in housing, big plans in investment in the, uh, electrical uh, irrigation, big plans that uh, make um, railways. But they do it, of course, with Chinese productions, with Chinese products. And uh, the fact is not only multilateral, but bilaterally, they have created some funds that are absolutely not possible in the case of Venezuela. Uh, the external debt of Venezuela today is oriented with China. And uh, they give us uh, cars from China, ra uh, radars from China, satellites. We have already a third satellite from China. And how do we pay that? With oil. Uh, China needs the raw materials. We are already with 650,000 barrels per day exporting. But we're not receiving any money of it. We had already received it because we, we, through Chinese goods yeah, that's made in a, in a joint uh, uh, bilateral um, fund that you, you cannot do say, okay, I'm going to, now I have uh, $20,000 million, I'm going to buy a French metro because it's cheaper. No, 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 you have to buy a Chinese metro. There's no way about it. So this is a new, not only the economical expansion, but also the geopolitical expansion through the mechanisms, and I will conclude because I think that I already took more than five minutes. Yeah, I nearly say pee pee. <laughs> so thank you very much. So I, I would say, in, in, in this I would end, that the expansion of economical, it's not only the expansion of the uh, economical enterprises that it also goes beyond that in the frame of change that will come, I think, uh, because of the democratic issue that will affect internally China. And I think that the international solidarity is very important in that. Second, 
they have played in a, on a triangular basis, if you want, to maintain the North North dialogue, which China has become a North country without any doubt, but has not forgotten the South roots. So they play on a triangular basis that it's in uh, the WTO components of the economical countries, European Union, United States, Australia, Japan, but at the same time they go and meet with the two-third parts of the United Nations G77 to say, look, we are like you. We are the third world and we are helping you. But uh, uh, the question is, who helps who? I will end here, uh, dear Marks, for the time being. Would you like to ask questions or shall I? Yes. Happy to easy. No, no one question in the middle of your presentation. I can only say how in your 15 minutes off a plane from Venezuela in the northern part of Latin America are you so extremely well informed about the situation in China on the other side of the world. <laughs> well, I want to tell you that because uh, since they were so glad to put me in this panel, that is the reason why I know more of China. <laughs> no, but, uh, well, you cannot avoid it. I'm not a specialist and uh, I, I'm a brother oriented in the struggle for democracy, human rights, action in Venezuela. I'm not a specialist in China, but you cannot uh, avoid the situation of seeing the effects of China. I have been very diplomatic and mild in this occasion. The, uh, the problem, another very important problem is look, you cannot avoid that since China is very interested in the case of Venezuela, a lot of corruption comes, probably not because of Chinese themselves, but there is nobody who is clean, I mean, in this kind of business, but because there are a lot of uh, enterprises owned by the government that since there's not a very transparent part of how China is doing in Venezuela, China has become one of the problems that we have in Venezuela because <coughs> not, not only the, the, the fact of the external debt that is growing, not only the fact of uh, the, uh, the series of um, uh, commitments that are changing completely the, 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 the game of what <coughs> there exists in Venezuela, for instance. Okay. We, uh, be, be, okay. But try, trying to answer. The question is uh, longer than the intervention. <laughs> so, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, I first apologize, despite indeed having an English father, you will notice that my English is very Gallic. So I apologize for, for this uh, accent. Um, so I was asked to speak uh, briefly about China in Africa, because I'm not at all a specialist of China, I'm a specialist of uh, Western Af West Africa. But indeed, the presence of China in Africa cannot uh, be uh, unseen. So it attacked, this theme attracts a lot of media attention, China in Africa, every week, in major newspaper, you read a, a, a report on Chinese investment uh, in Africa. But we could also see it in a longer historical perspective indeed. Not going back to the 15th century when the Chinese uh, trader, uh, Cheng Ho, traded with uh, the Swahili coast. Uh, no, in the 60s, uh, when Chu Enlai uh, had many visits to uh, friendly states in Africa. But at least we can say that there is, has been a long a standing interest of China uh, in Africa, at least going back to the 1950s. It's not such a new phenomenon. Indeed, uh, investment has been uh, really huge in the last uh, 15 years, but starting in the 50s and 60s, there was an uh, important Chinese interest. At the time, of course, China chose its partners in Africa along uh, following ideological uh, inclinations. So countries like Tanzania or Zambia or the French Congo were trading partners uh, to China. And the famous railway uh, between Tanzania and Zambia uh, has been uh, built by Chinese engineers. So just this kind of small note to remind us that it's not a new phenomenon, China in, in Africa. But of course, since the end of the 90s, it has been really a, a new, uh, a major economic expansion of China uh, in Africa. China is the first trading partner of the continent and is also the first direct investor uh, on the continent. And uh, the list of countries in which China has invested is just uh, impressive, but we can quote Zambia, Ethiopia, Sudan, Algeria, K 
Kenya, South Africa, Congo, Angola, Nigeria, Guinea. And you see that in this list of countries, it's mainly for oil, uh, raw materials, uh, energy. And this expansion uh, of China has been driven by an economic pragmatism, actually, not uh, by an ideological uh, approach. Except on one very sensitive issue, of course, the relation, diplomatic ties of African states with Taiwan. And what we have witnessed in the last 15 years is indeed a strategy by China to put in the balance of its investment the severance by African states of their diplomatic ties with Taiwan. And between 1996 and 2010, more than 14 states in Africa have uh, severed their relations with Taiwan. So that's uh, really the ideological, uh, political and geopolitical approach of China on uh, this issue. In fact, nowadays there's only four countries left on the continent which have diplomatic ties with Taiwan, and it's small countries that are not really strategic and important. It's Sao Tome and Principe, Burkina Faso, and Swaziland. But we can see that this economic clout of China does translate into geopolitical uh, pressure in some instances. For instance, recently the South African government has cancelled the visa uh, for the Dalai Lama, who was supposed to attend uh, an important ceremony in Cape Town. So, economic expansion, but also diplomatic activism. In fact, uh, if you accumulate the visit by the President, Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs of China in Africa, they have been to all the 54 sub uh, African states, but seven of them. I don't know any other country or European Union, even a cluster of countries, which has been so diplomatically present in terms of visits uh, in these countries in the last uh, 15 years. And China also has soft power uh, being exerted in Africa. If you look at the Confucius centers, so the centers, cultural centers of China in Africa, there was none on the continent in 2003. Now you have more than 25. The first one was created in 2004 in, uh, in Nairobi. And if you look at the numbers of students uh, learning Chinese in these cultural centers, you really have an important, uh, you have important numbers uh, there. But what phenomenon which also needs to be uh, looked at is human migration. The number of Chinese having migrated to uh, Africa is quite impressive. We, we don't really have reliable data on that, but it, it sees a minimum of hundreds of thousands of Chinese who have migrated to different countries of Africa either as workers for the big infrastructure uh, construction site of China, but also as shopkeepers. And not only in the cities, in the cities, but also in the rural areas. And now, nowadays, you see in countries like Senegal, Ghana, Zambia, uh, Chinese investing in uh, real estate, which, is, uh, which shows that they are here to stay and not uh, temporary uh, migrants. You also see marriages going on, actually. Uh, it's quite striking in the country of Senegal, but at the beginning, China was, Chinese were a kind of community, and not having very strong links with the local population, but nowadays you see uh, mixed marriages between Chinese and Senegalese all over uh, Dakar. So, should this expansion uh, be a subject of concern? Uh, in a way, it's true indeed that China is uh, helping authoritarian regimes like Zimbabwe and Sudan. This is really clear. Those countries that have had uh, sanctions imposed by the West indeed have found in uh, China a powerful ally to find alternative uh, funding and political and diplomatic and even military uh, support. Indeed, the dependency on the raw material of African economies is kind of deepened by this Chinese uh, imported demand. Uh, the spiral of debt, as Milos has mentioned, is indeed in, again increased by um, Chinese economic uh, Practice. And there has been indeed some popular discontent vis-à-vis -vis Chinese uh, expansion in Africa, especially in Zambia, uh, especially uh, workers complaining about working conditions. And one of the candidates who's, who has been um, since elected president of Zambia, Michael Sata, has had basically his political campaign was uh, Zambians for Zambia for Zambians, enough of these Chinese in Zambia. So you see a kind of clear political uh, reaction in this country. Also, African... In uh, traders have complained about uh, unfair competition in trade with Chinese uh, you know, uh, products uh, competing unfairly with African products. But this has been kind of uh, resolved in a way by China opening up uh, Guangzhou uh, for African uh, traders to go there and to 
reach uh, to have the, also themselves access to Chinese products. So this kind of uh, complaint by African traders in countries like Senegal or Guinea, Guinea has kind of uh, gone down. But we should, don't, we should not overestimate, again, I think, Chinese uh, ideological approach of Africa, because it's all about economic pragmatism. If we look at South Sudan, you know that China has supported Sudan uh, for so many years, but they were among the first to open up an embassy in South Sudan when South Sudan gained its independence, even though South Sudan was seen as a kind of political enemy of the ally in uh, Khartoum. And if you look at surveys that have been carried out about popular reactions to Chinese presence in Africa, what is striking is that people would insist on deliverables, saying we see the physical pre uh, effect of Chinese presence, stadium, roads, infrastructure. We've had 40 years or 50 years of Western cooperation, but we didn't see the deliverables in terms of infrastructure. So we have to be critical of this expansion, but we have to take into account the fact that for many people on the ground, they see this as a kind of uh, positive uh, effect. So I will uh, stop here because I think my five minutes are gone. Thank you. Thank you. So, <clears throat> My friend, Mr. Yang, will have the last word about the Chinese influence, okay? Um, I'm not sure if what I'm going to say will be last word. Um, China definitely is uh, present everywhere. China is an elephant in everybody's uh, living room nowadays. To some, maybe wolf. Huh. So, to start, I mean, first of all, the organizers of this um, uh, forum brutally signed me to five panels. This is the third within today. So I have to, according to, uh, have to go to my text, otherwise I repeat what I said previously. To start, we need to have a realistic assessment of China's economic power and its ability to employ it effectively around the world. To be sure, China is uh, the second largest economic power in the world. What's more is its uh, meteoric rise economically has taken all economic experts by surprise and shocked most of them. As China flexes its economic m muscles its economic strength gave it immense influence and impacts from Africa to Middle East to South Africa, from Europe to America. Because of its large economy strength and its rapid growth, China has the potential to become even more aggressive and domineering today than Russia. China's economic power has enabled it to support rogue regimes globally, including Iran, North Korea, Syria, and Sudan, just to name a few, to foment nuclear uh, proliferation with weapon technology and fissile material, to become a major aggressor using cyber warfare and technology theft. And more importantly, China invests in foreign countries with its own mentality and model. It put uh, its system forward uh, as an antidote to liberal democracy around the world. China's huge and rapidly rising economic power impacts its international relations in many ways. I want to focus on human rights. Other countries e who eager for Chinese commerce and investment are tempted to overlook the gross human rights violations, to temper resistance to China's unjustified territorial claims, and to cast their votes in the international bodies in ways that avoid incurring Beijing's displeasure. When a national government co to China out of 
deference to its economic strength. The government may be rejecting the clear express the preference of its electorate for short-term convenience and maneuver. As a result, this undermines the function of a democracy in that country and affects the democratic way of life in democracies. I have uh, tons of examples. Um, I, I can give you a few when we come to question and answer uh, session. But I want to emphasize China's ability to inflict overwhelming economic harm on its enemies is also exaggerated in political debate and the public mind. Nowadays, everybody says, oh, the rise of China, the China's power, I think to a large degree, it is exaggerated. There are a lot of reasons to support my argument. I just want to give you one. China's CCP has drained out its legitimacy in all ideology and practice. The only source of, for its legitimacy to rule in China is economic growth. It's a performance induced uh, uh, legitimacy. They have to perform economically well, otherwise they just lose everything. So in any case, they would not use economic power to jeopardize its trade relations with others. So actually, it benefits from economic uh, growth, and economic growth becomes its arch uh, a hill as well. And another thing I want to emphasize is that uh, in world powers, especially democracy, US for example, when I talk to the world leaders and the politicians, about human rights situation in China. Oftentimes, I figure out that they tend to believe if they take strong stance on human rights with China, China will retaliate economically against the country. But so far, it remains myth and tested myth. I ask so many people for example, a significant example, that China retaliate against the whoever the country who takes a strong uh, uh, stance on human rights. So what happened? Give you an example, significant example. I continue to ask people around. Yeah, I, it's just nothing from top of my head. So I think International community largely run into collective dilemma, uh, collective action dilemma. So China know very well to use one against another. I think uh, uh, the international community must develop mechanism to coordinate their response to China's pressure, whether it's the economic or political or military. Uh, respond to its aggression or intimidation. Such cooperation and solidarity will in turn significantly reduce China's ability to threaten any one country with harmful consequences or to play one nation off against another. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I may make a small comment. This is the voice of the dissident, so therefore you can judge for yourself Bias, in a way. <laughs> okay, so no, I'm just listening as a neutral person, yeah. then uh, you have the right to voice out, but they also have the right to. I think uh, the topic is actually expansion of the global economy influence of China. <laughs> and if you look at it realistically, what China needs is more energy and more raw material. And that's why the expansion into Africa and South America is for them to acquire all this raw material that they need, particularly energy, okay? 
And then China probably are playing the three-part role. Part one is to acquire this raw material on a long term. And secondly, they can start on the playing the political on the what you call Northern Mosque, whatever, international arena. And then they are going to play <coughs> also on business. Okay? The high tech entrepreneur, I mean Alibaba just got listed in the stock market, being one of the richest men. So these are the scenario that is what you may call the Chinese influence right now. Okay? So I like to open the floor for people to have a little short discussion, whatever we want to do. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Can you identify yourself yes. and then your question? Good afternoon. My name is Karine jean Tourlepe and I am a business coach living in Prague. I just have a question for Mr. Yan Li. You mentioned that, you know, maybe China will not retaliate. So what, why do you think that South Africa, you know, kind of didn't kind of invite, I mean, didn't insist on having Dalai Lama coming to their country? What kind of consequences do you think would have happened if they would have said, excuse me, you know, he's a guest, he's coming? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I, for this question, I still want to find an answer myself. So, uh, as I said, it's a myth. People tend to believe China will respond uh, by economic retaliation against the, whoever the country who issue a visa to uh, the Dalai Lama, for example. But we have to remember two things to understand China. You have to understand two things. Number one, economic performance is the only source of legitimacy for the current regime. They would do not, you know, economy would be the last thing they want to jeopardize. Trade would be the last thing they want to jeopardize, no matter what. So most of their threat is just a bluff. So we should test that, number one. Number two, if you really understand China, it is not the government per se who benefit from the economic growth, uh, growth. Of course, government benefit from a large base of tax and uh, you know, the, the special way to grab uh, property from the people. But individual officials benefit most, benefit most. When it comes to South Africa, maybe the business they're owned or controlled by officials. No matter what, they just bluff to say something but they continue the treat with uh, South Africa. I have a very, um, uh, I have a few examples. 2010, uh, Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize um, uh, Committee awarded Liu Xiaobo Nobel Peace Prize, who is my friend still languishing in Chinese prison as we speak. I actually represented him at the award ceremony, 2010. Uh, China, came out right away threatening uh, economic sanction against uh, Norway. They reduced the quota of the import of salmon from, uh, from uh, 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 Norway, which is, uh, is major, one of the major uh, industries. Another major industry is oil. But four days after the world ceremony, China state-owned, largest state-owned uh, oil company struck a very big deal with the Norway uh, oil, I forgot the name. And a few months later, I went to uh, Oslo to talk to an official in the commerce, uh, Chamber of Commerce, specifically asking him how you have how you been doing with the, you know, the reduction of the quota import to China. And uh, he told me it was the Chinese officials who dealing with the business that told them how to get around it. I understand it. Because these individuals benefit from it. So all I want to say is that we have to test the myth. Another example is Chen Guangcheng. You all know the blind uh, human rights uh, activist who uh, defended the uh, rights of women who were forced to abortion. 
and he was put in prison for a few years after he was released, the so-called release. He was put in, um, uh, 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 in his own home and uh, guarded by 20 uh, guards and beaten up severely. And the whole uh, China and the international community came to his support. And a friend of us managed to get him out of his home, took him to Beijing, he managed to enter the U.S. Embassy. So you still remember this episode, right? And the U.S. took a very strong, strongest for many years stance on this issue. They negotiate one solution. Beep, beep, can we make it short so other people can ask questions? Okay, you don't like uh, dissidents uh, comments. No, no, no. <laughs> that uh, is, uh, I think, I think no, it, no. I think you may go a little too far because you are, you have a lot of things against it. But I think your answer is very simple. Well, I, I try to answer. Let, her let question. me an, let me answer her question. Okay, on on your behalf. She she, she asked me. You, I don't but give you the power to represent me. No, no, no. I don't. I don't give your power to represent. No, me. I don't represent you. Your, but you I said would, your, your answer question. I think your un, your understanding. You should you should be. You should, you should be fair enough to let other people speak about too. So anyway, no, you go have ahead. No, uh, power go ahead. To, ever to speak on my behalf. No, I don't speak on your behalf. Okay. So go ahead. So let me finish. So after that, business is back to normal. No economic conflict. Business is going on. Everything. So. Oh, he doesn't want me to speak. So. Anybody, any question? Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Blanca Sulava. I'm a student at Charles University in Prague. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, China has been pursuing a policy of non-interference into internal affairs of several con of countries for a long time. However, as all of you agreed, uh, the, especially the economic influence of, and interest of China, especially in the field of energetics, are on the rise for a couple of years. So my question is, do you think that China can continue in pursuing this policy? And if not, can we already see some evidences all around the world? And what could be the, the, what could be the consequences of this on the world affairs? Thank you. I think it's very, very interesting and very important in linking the other interventions that you have. One, of course, the non-intervention is uh, one very well-received uh, position in the third world countries, basically because of the past experience with colonialism or with economical trends. But the, the, the big problem is when you privilege some systems that are not democratical and you privilege some situations that are not very transparent, and I speak about corruption, or when you do things that harm a country, you cannot have eternally the support of that country. I mean, to put it in other words, if China is supporting actively my country's government, which we criticize because of violation of human rights, because absence of democracy, because corruption, because a series of aspects, and they do not open for the future because there is a pendulum. I mean, they support today a regime in Venezuela, in Zimbabwe, or in North Korea. But uh, the Chinese have a historical vision that go further on. What would happen if the situation changes? Is China going to be with this enormous external debt to say, look, you, you did an external debt without uh, seeing the questions of constitution in Venezuela, for instance, or in Zimbabwe? You had here uh, a, a tremendous, uh, what I was saying about the fund, a fund that was not authorized in the parliament by the opposition. So the question is, this is not eternal. And the main aspect that, uh, that you mentioned is the vision, I think, that the world is going to two big frames. One is the social needs of changement. This is the Millennium Summit. But the other one is the ones of freedom, of democracy, and of uh, liberties. Uh, so, uh, there is no doubt how much it will take, I don't know, but these regimes of dictatorships are ending and the protests that we have in young people in, 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 in Africa, in Arab countries, in Latin America, in Hong Kong, shows 
that people are looking for something different. So, returning to China, is China going to maintain this sort of government-to-government uh, -government relation without seeing further on this evolution? This is something that, of course, will depend on the Chinese authorities. But the fact that being good today doesn't mean that they have assured forever the relation if it's not tackled with the principles, with the values, and the changement that can occur in some of the Latin American, African, and Asian countries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, indeed, in Africa too, this policy of non-interference is really popular among leaders and public opinion. Uh, but, and we don't find that many examples of direct Chinese uh, involvement in internal politics, except indeed outspoken support for the Khartoum regime in uh, Sudan. And when there was the whole Darfur issue, indeed China was clearly supporting uh, the central government. By, uh, by, as a derivative, China also played a huge role in Chad that is not well known uh, in the public. But indeed, China, because of its oil interest in Darfur, was close to some rebel movements in Chad, exerting pressure on Jamena. Uh, so there's this type of direct uh, you know, political pressure on some countries. But apart from these examples, <laughs> China indeed perhaps has cultural or political affinities with authoritarian regimes, but China also invests in democracies like Senegal and Ghana and doesn't really make a, a difference. And China is happy with regime change as long as it doesn't harm uh, its interests. So in this way, China is kind of similar to Germany, France, or the US, who indeed, uh, what counts is their economic interest in these countries. And if the election brings regime change without uh, jeopardizing these economic interests, they will not uh, interfere in this process. So, including in Zambia, where China could have been concerned that indeed this presidential candidate who had this anti-Chinese campaign would be a danger, they had to, you know, accept the result. He's in power, and now he has watered, watered down his anti-Chinese discourse and their business back as usual. So I would say uh, it's going to stay like this. I don't see China uh, changing this non-interference uh, policy, I think. Any other question? The floor. Yes. I'm sorry, I have another question. What kind of economical relationship that China has with Czech Republic. Anybody knows? I'm not an expert there. No, is, this, is it kind of a, because I know, you know, living here, I know there is a lot of Asian kind of developing here, but is there any kind of specific expansion in Central Europe? Yes, there is. Nobody else wants to answer. No question, I'm uh, from Czech Academy of Scientists. I'm a sinologist. Uh, Czech-Chinese uh, relations are go undergoing a very abrupt change because uh, previous uh, policy of uh, focus on human rights is being evaluated and the uh, Czech Republic is trying to build very strong economic ties with China. Uh, also this comes in line with China's uh, so-called 16 plus 1 initiative which is a policy of uh, building relations with Central and Eastern European countries, which is, uh, in another words, post-communist countries of uh, <clears throat> Central and Eastern Europe. So China is very active in the region and Eastern European countries, including Czech Republic, are um, playing the game of China. We can say, for example, Czech, uh, Czech president, uh, Václav, the previous one, Václav Klaus, was a frequent guest in China. Um, current president uh, Miloš Zeman is about to visit China uh, in the upcoming weeks. So we see a very strong focus on building, especially economic ties with China. Uh, Czech Republic's uh, government recently has signed a declaration where it is said that uh, Czech Republic supports uh, territorial integrity of China, especially uh, does not support uh, independence of Tibet. Etc. I think if you, I don't know, anybody traveled to China at all? Where have you been in China? Uh, Shanghai, Beijing. Okay, have you been to the western part like Yunnan and Chengdu and all these places? No, I have not. No. Hmm. Yes. I have been there. Why are you asking? 
because I think this is something that maybe the audience like to know, that the Western world like to close the income gap. But China is not closing the income gap. Beijing and Shanghai, they are as modern as New York and London. But when you go to the West in Yunnan, they are almost as poor as uh, near India. You go to the poor villages, you know, you can buy a pot of uh, earthen pot making boiling Chinese medicine for about 12 krona here. And yet the people are happy. I go there and I buy the poor tea and all this, and I can sit and chat with them. And they make goods, and therefore, sometimes uh, protest. Well, uh, uh, North Korea you have, people, you have, you have no right. North, so, North so, Korea people are more happy. No, are you, are, you have no right. When, when it's time for me to speak, you better shut up. You better shut you up. No right to express. You know, no, no. Uh, I, I, I hold a key. When they ask question, I talk. But when I talk, you better not. You better shut up. When I ask you to talk, you talk. We are not in China now. This is dictatorship. Okay, so he spoiled my emotion to talk now, so better keep quiet. I did my job. So any other question that you'd like to know? Yes. I have a question for Mr. Yeah. Yang Tian Li. Uh, we have uh, heard some a mention about uh, China's uh, soft power policy and also for other panelists, yeah. uh, if willing to express. Uh, what do you think about China's uh, so-called soft power? For example, the Confucius Institutes, I think uh, the numbers, in the numbers they are growing. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, as we have recently seen the situation at the Chinese Studies Association in Portugal, the uh, chairman or the head of uh, Chinese uh, foreign language instruction made a huge diplomatic faux pas and she's still in, in position. So from another point of view, I think uh, China is doing everything to spoil its uh, soft power, civilized superpower image that it, I think, partially has succeeded in constructing. So what do you think about the efficiency of China's soft power? Okay, uh, that's a very, very good, very important question. Um, the China, according to our chairman, become two China, right? One is elite own China, the other is the general uh, public's China. So the difference he just described. But China has made effort to project image to the whole world, say economic growth model, uh, as opposed to liberal democracy. They try to import the so-called soft power to the world. What, the, what do Chinese people have? I mean, China has soft, soft power. They have to go to the history, go to tradition, Confucius. Confucius become a brand name. So they use uh, Confucius as a brand name to establish Confucius Institutes everywhere in the world. Uh, that's very good uh, 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 thing I want to talk about. On one hand, you know, not only the Confucius Institute established in every country, but also the media. There was a, a government project which is called uh, Grand Propaganda. I don't know if you have heard it. It's a Grand Propaganda to project China's image to the whole world, uh, export soft power. And so far, the, the effect, effectiveness uh, is uh, f uh, very limited because uh, those media only uh, uh, have a very limited audience as readers, the Chinese people themselves. So most of them actually in Chinese language have a very little if any influence on their, um, uh, uh, the mainstream of the society as far as I see in the United States. But there's another danger uh, which I want to talk about is Nowadays, even in the United States, the scholars compromise so much <coughs> to the so-called China's power. I give you a few examples. One, there's 18 scholars want to write a book 
have a, you know, a, a book about Xinjiang province, uh, Uyghur's situation. The chief editor felt he had to talk to the Chinese embassy first to ensure them that this book would not be politic, political. It's just you know, uh, mutual kind of a thing. So the, the scholar, very respected scholar in the United States, 18 of them, as a result of the publishing of this book, majority of them were banned visas to China. Another example is with regard to a high school student. Uh, American high, student, high school student was in Beijing on an exchange program. He wrote pro-democracy notes on his fellow Chinese uh, notebook, but he got punished by his American school. Not Chinese school, but American school, which you know, had a, a big repercussion in, in the United States. Confucius Institute uh, have affiliation with many American institutes with the terms which should not be accepted by uh, uh, U.S. standard, something like, or oh, in this uh, institute, uh, no Falun uh, Gong, Tiananmen cannot be talked about it. Uh, Tibetan cannot, Tibetan issue cannot uh, uh, talk about. It. But these terms are, uh, in fact, accepted by the American institute, which I think is a great danger. So China's so-called influence has already affected the democratic lives of the democracies. That's what I want to say. Maybe a couple of uh, ideas. There's a saying in English, you need two to tango, or il faut deux pour le mariage for a friend Etienne, by the French say. And I think that the soft power is also a mix of uh, the economical global expansion of China. So it's not only that the Chinese are looking for this soft, soft power, but a young student says, well, because of the economical expansion, I'm going to study Chinese. I want to study Chinese. It's not only that Chinese are present to offer Chinese, but the young people <coughs> find more and more the possibility of future jobs uh, speaking Chinese or learning Chinese, which was probably 20 years ago something not, uh, at the, no young man would study Chinese in that time. Second, is the question of the huge culture that China has. When I say China, it's not only mainland China. You go to Taiwan and you see the arts of China itself. It's amazing. So uh, uh, it is also the part of the history that is uh, bringing independently of it comes from mainland or it comes from uh, Hong Kong, the, the, the tradition. And it goes, uh, the soft power, not necessarily by the state, if you go uh, uh, around the world, the gastronomy, the Chinese restaurants are all around it. And it's not necessarily the Chinese who are promoting this question. But it, this is a presence that is more and more uh, linked to the uh, fact of, of this expansion. The other fact is uh, that Etienne mentioned, it's very important and you can see it also in Latin America. It is the more people go out, the more mixed marriages are found. So these mixed marriages, for instance, you have a, a series of mixed marriages in Central America and Mexico of Chinese that become not Chinese there, but they become Mexican or Costa Rican or adapted to the country or Brazilian, which could mark a very important uh, changement in the future. Because uh, this is something that, of course, the parent, uh, the father or the mother is Chinese and the other is from Senegal or from Costa Rica. But this, the mentality is going to have a very strong impact. And finally, and uh, to end, how the Chinese diplomacy has changed. I am so old as uh, my dear moderator remembered that I remember some diplomats in the Mao time. The ambassadors did not speak languages. They had a translator. Probably he was the chief. But uh, you would speak with an ambassador, it was a translator. Today, you see the change in the Chinese diplomacy. You go to Latin America and they speak perfectly Spanish. They go to France and they speak perfectly French. They go to the United States. They, per they have evolved. It's not only the soft power of Chinese, but the, 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 the presence on a modernization 
uh, has affected, and of course that means that they can be more effective. They don't need a translator <coughs> to do their, uh, their work. Uh, together with uh, what you were saying, the success of hundreds of students uh, that are sending China to United States or to Europe that are uh, more and more learning the know-how and the science and the technology, and they are doing very well in the part of the studies. So all this makes that the soft power is not only in one way, it, it is like a tango that goes in, in the two ways, in the two, in the two sides. That, therefore, I, I want to insist again, the changement, it's not only the changement that China could do in, with the non-intervention, but that gradually the big issues, the big principles will affect internally mainland China in the democratic and in the human rights question. I hope at least. Thank you. Uh, for Africa, I think it's a long-term uh answer only. Like we don't know yet what will be the inf soft power uh, influence of China in Africa. It's going to take time. But if you look at numbers of students from Africa going to China, it's quite impressive already. I mean, China is really competing with the US and Europe in terms of attracting students. Just to give you one figure, I was recently uh, in Ghana. In Ghana, for the whole country, France had seven scholarships for uh, Ghanaian students, even though France has a long tradition of uh, scholarships for African students. China had 83. The same in Kenya, China had basically between eight and 10 times more scholarships than uh, France for students. Of course, it was only for engineering, uh, chemistry, physics. It was not social sciences, economics. So that's also a limitation of China in terms of attracting foreign students. It attracts students for the field of engineering, hard sciences, but for instance, for leadership, uh, social sciences, and so on, of course, China is not uh, training those people, so it's not training future leader yet, future leaders yet, unless engineers become uh, leaders. But in the military, China is also uh, training a lot, but uh, lower ranks uh, officers. It's still seen as more, more prestigious to go and study in military academies in the US or uh, UK than China. But lower ranks, as we know, will go up the ladder, and in 15 or 20 years, you will find, you know, uh, upper ranks of the military in many African countries trained uh, in China. That's important in terms of the role of the army uh, in politics uh, and so on. In terms of the language, as you mentioned, uh, China has made an effort to vernacularize, vernacularize its message. Uh, in Kenya, in Nairobi, they have Radio China International and it has broadcasting in Kiswahili and it's quite widely uh, listened to. And actually, we had one student from our university, uh, Sciences Po, who was interning in this uh, Radio China International. And they told him, you can do reporting on anything you want except China. So, and he, I had talked with him and he, you know, he testified that there was, kind of, there was a public for uh, Radio China International uh, in Kenya. So, so for Southeast Asia, for education, we like to promote three languages, local, English, and then Chinese. So this is a sort of the influence for the future. If you want to do trading with China, you better learn how to speak Chinese. This is probably what the influence is all about. And people are not uh, too crazy about the ism or whatever, communism, whatever. They are more interested to find opportunity for them for the future. This is what it is. Oh, any other question? Yes? Uh, hello, and uh, thanks for this chance for a tourist. I'm not a student here. And uh, I, have a, I have a question actually about Africa. And uh, I'm sorry, I cannot read, read it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mr. Smith. Okay, Mr. Smith, and um, yeah, have you ever been in Africa or I work in Africa or something like that? Has it been, sorry? I mean, have you ever been in Africa? Me? Yeah. If I've been? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so do you know some uh, Chinese people or Chinese worker, Chinese businessman in Africa? Yeah, I've met many in Senegal. Okay, I mean, this, this ch um, Chinese people, as they uh, play with uh, Africa people, I mean, do some sport together, or go to make a party together, or cooking, or watch a movie, something like that? 
Uh, well, it depends. At the beginning, no, clearly. I mean, you had like Chinese enclaves in Dakar on one special avenue where they, had, they were all shopkeepers. And indeed, at the time, there was not many relationships, social relationships going on. It was only uh, Chinese owning shops and Senegalese being the retailers for this shop. But after a while, indeed, some social relations have started. I've seen myself Chinese speaking perfect Wolof in Senegal, which is a vehicular language in Senegal. And usually when the French people go to Senegal, they don't learn Wolof because they think French is the official language. It's enough. When Chinese come, they do make the effort to learn Wolof and they interact with Senegalese on a kind of more equal basis than the French, for instance. And that's how you see so many Chinese speaking Wolof in Senegal. And I've seen mixed marriages. I've seen, you know, uh, going to parties together and so on. So yeah. this is happening. I'm not saying it's a general rule that can be generalized, but you cannot say that uh, Chinese are not mingling with other yeah. And, and, uh, but I believe a lot of Chinese businessmen in Africa, they just do 100% just business. They don't interest in Swahili or in this culture, right? Yes, uh, for many of them. But for instance, one of the uh, uh, wrestlers in Senegal, Senegal is a country where there's an important tradition of wrestling, wrestling, uh, la lutte, and one uh, Chinese uh, Shopkeeper is, has become a star in Senegal in wrestling, Seneg traditional Senegalese uh, wrestling. So it's a proof that he has, you know, interacted with fellow Senegalese uh, wrestlers and so on. He's not only here for business. Perhaps his parents came to Senegal only for business, but he's here to stay. Okay. Maybe he's from Mongolia. Good wrestler. <laughs> Please. Maybe he's from Mongolia. Okay. Okay. They are very good wrestler. Okay. And. Uh, and another question about uh, the soft power. And I think uh, all the time the people are talk about uh, the soft power from China is just about business, actually money. And uh, I don't know how many people know a uh, Chinese musicer or movie maker or artist or... Again, to take the example of Dakar and Senegal, you'd be surprised how Chinese movies are much more popular than any other movies, except perhaps Indian movies. It's not European or American movies that are popular in Senegal. It's Chinese and Indian movies. So that's a type of uh, soft power. It is something like uh, Bruce Lee or Jackie Chan, Chet Li. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> and even newer ones. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. But uh, you're right. The question is not immediately. You cannot see it. For instance, in Venezuela, in Latin America, there are, because of the economical trend, they're getting also to change HBO, for instance. And you can see in the HBO, uh, I don't know if only for Latin America or also for other parts in the world, but in Latin America you can see a series of pictures that are not, you can see also uh, the wrestling and everything, but Chinese pictures made in China, good pictures. Of course, that doesn't mean that uh, it is only about Chinese, but Chinese are entering through international mechanisms, HBO, or through uh, different ways, uh, uh, because it also it goes uh, the other way. Probably, if you're a manager of a construction uh, building, you're not going to linger. But the workers that you bring together with the time, it's not automatical, will have these two effects. For instance, even in Caracas, there is a place where all the Chinese who live there sell their products, and they import a lot of things from China. So this has become a sort of uh, Chinese quarter in Caracas. Uh, the 80% are Chinese who go there and buy, you know, the different dishes for their food and the imports. But you have 20, uh, started with 5, with 10, with 15, with 20, and more and more Venezuelans that has nothing to do with China go there because they start to get into the uh, Chinese culture. And, uh, well, when, when they are there, they, they see the, the songs of China. And uh, so I think that it's gradual. It's not automatic. It's not that you punch, you say, well, this was, yeah. uh, did not know. But I think there is a tendency that is getting, at least in Latin America, more through uh, movies, through gastronomy, through the presence of enterprises. And this has a double effect. This okay. also has effect for Chinese people there. Okay. And if you go to Peru, yeah. you go to the restaurant, you know what a Peruvian yeah. called restaurant is? Uh, uh, please? They call Chufan. 
Okay, it's Chinese. Okay, they, they, okay. <laughs> so okay. the if the <laughs> <laughs> so therefore they, this how the influence go in become become the name uh, become restaurant. In Chinese Peruvian, it's something different. It's not Chinese. It's not Peruvian. It's Chifa. <laughs> It, it, it come from the Chinese yeah, yeah, word fun, right? Yes, okay. yes. Close enough. Okay, any other questions? Uh, not, I'm not finished, actually. But oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I think uh, it's fair that uh, okay, let everybody... Thanks. Yeah. thanks. <laughs> well, any other... Questions? I guess we have a very interesting afternoon, okay? And otherwise, you can continue if you like to continue yeah, your sure. question. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay. So, a question to. Uh, can you identify yourself first and you are from where and all these things so everybody know uh, Your name and then where uh, are you from? Actually, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Chinese and my name is Wei. I'm just tourist here. Pardon? My, my you are student here in no. Prague? Oh, this tourist, uh, he does not want to his identity be made public, right? Yeah, no, I come from China, I'm Chinese and uh, my name is Wei. It's actually Chinese name, but it sounds like the English word Wei. Okay. And I'm ch just a tourist in Prague for five days. Uh -huh. And a question to Dr. Yong, Yang, yeah. And it says that the, the, the one reason for the, the CCP, CCP is the, the economy makes the party legal. So can, maybe this, um, so more in the uh, foreign... Uh, you can speak Chinese, I will translate for you. You can ask me a question that I uh, translate to the audience and answer your question. Okay. You can uh, use yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, I, I can't speak English, but I will try it. I oh. think his English is good enough. <laughs> it's, it, it's just tourist English, I'm sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and I think uh, a, a, a lot of countries make business with China. It's actually, they, they support the party, right? And if, if the party doesn't have a lot of money, lot of money anymore, so maybe the Chinese people will say no. Now, I, I, I don't want to make a deal with the party. I want to get my freedom back. So, I mean, maybe th uh, this is the, the, the... And now we are living in 2004. Maybe the, the zeitgeist is just shopping, 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 and buy, 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 more, more, more. And a lot of people they, they, no. they just buy a lot of things and just throw it away. So one way thing from, from China because it's cheap. I mean, I mean, maybe, maybe it's all the ah, to help you out, to help you out, what is your question? I try to say, maybe, what, as, a, as a normal people, what can I do? What can you do? Yeah. Uh, that, that's very good. No. You yes. want to answer? Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, because yesterday I heard it from 2000 nearby National Museum, and uh, today I heard another one. Yeah, uh, let, I sort of understand your question. Number one, yeah. uh, every country is doing business with China. So the government has a lot of money. If you don't do business with uh, China, the government will not have so much money. Yeah. So doing business actually is to support the regime. That's your first question, right? Second, so as a normal person, what you can do, right? Okay. First. We never oppose trade with China. Because we just want to remind the world, trade itself may not bring democracy, freedom to China by itself. So we have to do something else. And when trading with China, the international community, especially democracy, should not forget their principles. The principles on which their country are built and uh, in many cases, China's the intimidation is incredible. It's just a bluff. I want to just point out this fact. 
So don't worry if you take a strong stance on human rights. As a normal person, I really respect your question. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm really encouraged by your question. And I, I don't expect you to stand up against the government, which is very dangerous. We'll put you in uh, jail. As, as, as I was, I was in jail for five years. But you first learn how to do, how to be an independent, independent person. In China, a lot of information disseminated from the government. First of all, you have to find a way to find information. Yeah, yeah the real information and come up with your own judgment. I think that's the first thing you have to do. Once you've done that, you know what is the next step. Thank you. But don't, don't do any dangerous thing to uh, endanger your uh, safety in China. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank I really encourage that question. Well, I think we are coming near the end. So I would like each of our speakers to summarize, because I have been asked by the organizer in the couple of previous talks, no summary. So I'd like each of our speakers to use a few minutes to summarize their points. OK? OK, so, so we start the same order. Thank you for your presence. I will uh, start with our moderator on the line to say, without any doubt, in the case of Latin America and Africa too, as Etienne told us, uh, China is, uh, with its economical boom, global expansion, is looking forward uh, to uh, assure the resources, to assure the oil, the minerals, to assure the basis of uh, the continuous growth, and that's, that's normal, that's uh, absolutely normal. The second part, it's oriented in a very uh, privileged way for China. That's normal too. Every country has the needs, and, and uh, Yang was uh, telling us we cannot go against it. But the second feeling that I think is very, very important uh, today is the fact that not, but what was I mentioning, it's not only to make, the give, as a, to use a Chinese advert, the fish today, but to show how to fish in the way of some principles, orientations. I would say that it's important for the government on China know that it is very important to be transparent. That means no corruption in the hands of some of the third world countries. <clears throat> you can do extraordinary good things in the exporting of products, but if you are going to put it in the pocket of some people or in the hands of the military as privilege, as a nomenclatura, as a new class, well, you are creating a reaction against China in the future. Because they say, well, oh, yes, uh, it was good in Chinese products, but who has the Chinese car? Military, if it's a military government. Or it is more on the basis of a more sound principles. The third thing that I think in that frame, it's very important, of course, I, don't, I will not ask the governments, because as our Czech friend said very properly, well, governments are looking for relations, economical relations, and it is normal to, not only from the Chinese side, but from the European side, from the American side. But again, the very important issue, and it has been shown, is not to leave the flag of human rights of democracy, of freedom. There are ways to do it. I mean, it's not to create there a sort of uh, new uh, diplomats who, who go to the square of Tiananmen, <coughs> but there are through United Nations, there are through some of the treaties that exist in Geneva, uh, possibilities to frame the principles and in that way to help these kind of reactions that we're seeing uh, today. And finally, I would say in, in uh, my- Summary, uh, please, okay. Uh, yes, a, a summary. I would say that uh, it is very important, of course, to stress these South-South relationships of China, but oriented to a, a sound development in the frame of uh, the United Nations principles, and not only in the commercial basis. Etienne? Thank you. So, 
I agree with very pretty much everything Milos just said, so I won't be long, but indeed uh, China should perhaps learn from learn a lesson from the experience of Europe or US in, for the last 50 years in Africa, that betting on only the government and ignoring society in the long run is not a wise move. In the short term, it can bring some contracts, it can indeed help uh, economic growth of China, but in the long run, indeed, it's betting on the more democratic regimes within Africa, and they do exist, that pays off uh, more. Yep, I fully support the idea of free trade. And I support every country sub, uh, trade with China. But when we talk about free trade, you have to remember um, the other side, the other partner with trade is not free. The whole country is not free. What you should deal with this kind of fact. So when dealing with China, many countries, including powerful democracies, gradually and knowingly uh, give up, giving up its principles. As I said in my co uh, comments, I have a lot of examples about that. We should have uh, alert to this development and do something to roll back this trend. And another thing is uh, China tried very hard with its economic power to project its image to the world and dazzling the so whole, whole world with its wealth, power, but we should not forget there is another China which is not projected to the world. It's China, we shouldn't forget, the majority of the people who still live in very poor uh, condition without right to express themselves. When people have a, no right to freely express themselves, you cannot say they are happy. If you go to North Korea, you ask the people whether they're happy, they will tell you they are very happy. Thank you. Well, uh, the session is coming to a close. That give them a big hand to the panel here. And I think what is really important for the world is really to be recognized, to have mutual respect. And if we can have mutual respect, then I think the world will go far, no matter what. All right? And thank you for coming to this session. I hope you have a little thing to go back to think about. All right? Thank you. Thank you, all participants. Thank you. Thank you.